I mean, do you put a lot of weight on, on the reception history? I mean, because, for example, the tradition history says that Mark was the disciple of Secretary of Peter. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and so that's just as strong. And you, I mean, do you, do you think the fact that people over 100 years later started saying that is is good evidence or? I mean, yeah, I don't think necessarily it was over 100 years later for the case of the gospel I, of John. Oh, really? uh, and I, I'm definitely. Oh, 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 hold on a second. When, 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 when was John first named as John? Uh, so I'm, I'm Irenaeus, I think, is the one who gives us our earliest indication. My my sense is that, you know, Papias does know the Gospel of John, and he's writing, I think, in the he doesn't name it early as John, second though. century. He doesn't name it as John. Not in the pieces of Papias that survive. Well, um, right. But we're at, so I'm asking, when is the first name John? And Papias may have called it John. He may have may have called yeah. it Fred. I don't know. <laughs> right. I mean, is there is there a reason to think he named it John? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a clear reason to think that Papias, uh, uh, yeah, named it John. I just want to be clear about this. The <laughs> first time it's actually meant, named as John is Irenaeus. Yeah. It's usually dated at 180 or 185. Yeah, that's right. So that would be 80 or 85 years later. So I just wanted to be clear that the, the reception history doesn't start like, you know, the year after it was written. This is where I really diverge on Bart, uh, Bart's analysis of some of these things. And um, I question... I have to question maybe potential bias that that creeps into his analysis. I mean, he's arguing here that the reception history on John on the Gospel of John doesn't really start until we hit Irenaeus uh, toward the latter part of the second century. So, just as a, a brief review, the Gospel of John is traditionally dated around 90, um, 90 AD. Uh, Irenaeus is writing around one hundred eighty one eighty five AD. So this is you know, near a century later. And this is the, um, it needs to be said that this is not the first, Bar says this is the first identification of John. It's the er, it's the earliest surviving identification of that gospel as being the gospel of John. We know the gospel was out there. It was being quoted before this. And um, we have the diatessaron, which um, is essentially um, a harmonization of the four gospels um, early, about 20 years earlier around the year 160. So the gospel of John is out there. The, uh, the John literature is being quoted. Um, I don't think Bart would dispute that. I think he he believes that, you know, John is being written close to the end of the first century. Um, and it's out there, it's being circulated. We just don't have um, people when they write about it saying that this is the gospel according to John. Now, um, there is an issue about um, one of the very earliest church fathers named Papias, who only survived, we don't have direct um, writings of Papias, it's a, kind of the, one of the lost things of the church, um, and would give us, you know, a lot of more history of what was going on right around the, you know, beginning parts of the, of the second century. Uh, Papias only, so his writings only survive um, by quotations that we find in Irenaeus, in, you know, 185, and then Eusebius at the beginning of the fourth century, which is when the, at a time when the church is starting to come into, um, um, you know, good graces with the uh, Roman Empire and just growing in strength. Um, so this, it's pretty clear uh, to me that Papias did know the Gospel of John. Uh, Hugo is certainly arguing for that. One of the reasons, and Richard Bachman brought this up again in his book, one of the reasons to think of to think that that's the case is that um, one of the surviving writings we have from Papias are just, you know, a fragment of writing. Uh, Papias lists um, in a, his prologue um, a uh, six disciples, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, and John. Those six disciples um, are the six of the seven disciples expressly mentioned in John's gospel. The only one who's missing is Matthew. And it's not just that Apius is, you know, identifying six of the seven same disciples. He's also putting them in the exact same order. Um, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, and John, as they're introduced in um, the gospel of John. So the odds of that happening independently are, astronomical it's possible that both the author of the gospel of john and papias were both copying from some sort of um, previous source document where they're independently copying them from them but it's i think far more likely that um, papias just had access to john 
Um, I mean, there was tradition that he actually had spoken to one of the Johns. Maybe that's John the Elder, who, you know, some identify with uh, John the son of Zebedee and others identify as a completely unique person. I tend to fall into the category that John the Elder is a unique person. Um, so, so Bart argues here that, well, you know, Papias probably did know um, the Gospel of John, but he might have known as the Gospel of Fred. <laughs> so, so, um, and this is an argument he's made in the past. Probably you run into with arguments like this that, okay, the the Gospels are being circulated and with um, anonymously. We don't know who the authors are. There's no titles attached to them. I mean, this is the, the problem is every um, complete version of a Gospel that we've ever found and every version that we had the ending to because titles were attached to the ending has the title of the Gospel. And the titles are generally uh, just placed at the very end of the document. And it says gospel according to, or this is the gospel according to, you know, uh, Mark, Matthew, what have you. Um, we've never found a, um, a, a gospel or a gospel fragment with the ending that lacks that title. You know, so in the internal text, yes, we don't have the author saying, hi, my name is Ma Mark, or hi, my name is Matthew. But whenever we found... Um, the, the documents themselves where you would have a title, the titles would always be there as a, kind of an independent um, attestation of who the author was. Now, these are later often, so I can see why Bart is skeptical of this, but you can just start to run into what kind of problems you run into when you're trying to place the authorship titles to a document a century after they were written. And, and the problem is, you know, for example, you know, Papias um, is uh, supposedly in the area of Heropolis near Greece. Um, we, you know, other people who have, um, like Irenaeus is in Lyon, so he's in southern France or central France. We have other people uh, discussing the Gospel of John in Alexandria, where we have the earliest fragment of John and that's survived, and then uh, obviously in Rome as well. Um, no one is ever, when they're discussing this gospel, if they name it, no one is ever saying, oh, this was the gospel according to Fred or any other person. Whenever there is a author that is named by one of these um, early church figures as being identified or associated with the work, it's always the same. And that's that's the, the case amongst each of the four gospels. We just don't have competing claims to the authorship from that time. So yes, you might have a case where someone is debating on who John is, but everyone is agreeing that the gospel is being attributed according to John, nobody else but quote unquote John. And that's the case with Mark and Matthew and Luke as well. So it's hard to just imagine a scenario where you have this very diffuse church that's existing all throughout the Mediterranean. Um, I guess you could probably argue during the second century that the that the area of Asia Minor, Minor present day Turkey, is the most powerful region. But it's it's there. It doesn't necessarily have the most pull. Rome has a lot of pull. There's obviously you know the church is spreading into to France and Alexandria in, in Egypt is very important as well. And that's where we're because of the the dry climate there. Um, that's where a lot of the surviving um, uh, textual fragments of the of the New Testament documents um, are coming from Alexandria. Um, so when you have a, a church that's just diffuse and, you know, there's no Internet or, the, you know, people, there's no, um, you know, Pony Express, people are communicating. It takes months over time. If to add, and there's no central authority, I should add, I should add that too. To add on to this some sort of um, mechanism by which we're going to have an author ascribed to a work late after this work has been circulating all throughout the Roman Empire, and then it's being, we're going to somehow attach an author to it late in the process, we should see evidence of competing author names at that point. We should see um, people saying, oh, no, this is a gospel according to a different person. And one of the reasons we should see that is because we know that the four Gospels are circulating by that. I mean, in fact, you know, with the Diatessaron, we know that we have four different Gospels circulating 
um, because they are harmonized in the diatessaron in around the year 155. So uh, and Papias is, you know, in the year, you know, 107 or whenever Papias is writing, um, he clearly identifies Matthew and Mark as independent Gospels. I know there's a dispute or these are the same Matthew and Mark. I think it's almost impossible to imagine that he just came up with these two names, Matthew and Mark, and they were completely different documents, especially the name Mark, which is not a Jewish name. That's a, it's a um, Greco-Roman name. So to just come up with this name Mark, and there just happened to be another gospel with the name Mark, completely different than the one we have is, you know, kind of beggar's belief. The odds of that are astronomical. So we know that these gospels were circulating um, at that time in the very, you know, right around the, the time of the turn of the century, probably earlier for the other three gospels. And to identify one and distinguish them from another, you're going to have to have an identifier, a name. That's how we did, like, how we distinguish between different books. You know, if you have a library, you can't just say, "Oh, please give me the book." Um, you need a, a title for that book. So it's almost impossible to imagine that these works were being circulated without titles um, at any time in their history. And certainly, a hundred years in, you would see competing titles. You could see you would see competing names of authors, and we just have no. There's just no evidence for that. So. Um, I think if you you take the body of evidence here, um, it's just it's hard to believe that that um, that John was being circulated under a different name. So to the extent you want to accept the reception history, I think you have to accept the reception history with with the understanding that these works were immediately being attributed to specific authors. I know Bart rejects this, and I know that's been a kind of a central. Um, argument that he's been making for almost 20 years now, I, I just don't buy it. And I don't think it works. And we don't really have any example of something like this ever working, where you, you're having one piece of work uh, circulating through a broad region. The Roman Empire was very large and circulating through this broad region with no title or um, competing titles. I mean, when, when a book has no title, someone's going to give a title to it. So you're going to immediately start getting competing titles in different regions if there's no title. I just don't buy it. I don't think there's any example of it in history. I think it's it's just an argument that's never worked. 